Concrete Jungle is a community project supported by Green Room 136. Looking for awesome bags for your urban carry? Check out greenroom136.com for urban bags designed and handmade in Malaysia. greenroom136.com Music for this podcast is courtesy of guitar wizard Asamat by his album at asamat.bandcamp.com Okay, welcome to the show. Uh, today we have uh, George Wong. George Wong is the director for the Center of Asian Photographers. Uh, before we begin to talk about uh, this new uh, cafe and uh, um, what do you, how will you, how will you define this? A, a space for photographers? Yeah, it's a, it's like a photographer's community center. Right. So before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about George and uh, his his background. Just give us uh, a whole perspective of where uh, who you are. Um, okay, well, I think career-wise, I've been in um, the photo industry since I graduated from college. Right. Even in college, I was, um, I was selling cameras as a part-time job. Uh, that was where I funded most of my geekery during college, you know. So I, I spent my weekends working when everybody else was drinking, maybe. You, you were know? doing this on your side or were you working for, for a retailer? Uh, it's 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 you know those agencies you know those promoter work you know so you go out and I specifically just sold cameras I didn't right. sell anything else so I started there actually I did not learn anything on photography or you know it started from just selling the product and my personality is if I want to sell something I have to understand it right e- even though I I don't enjoy it so I, I spent a lot of time learning about it and I was one of those people at the road shows you know who is unlike other people who's just trying to sell. I right. knew so much about the camera that I spent more time teaching someone how to use the camera than selling the camera. So, so you're more uh, you you're more critical about you know, being a user before you can you can sell the product. Yes, I mean you know, I, it's it's the only way to sell. Yeah, you have it is. To, you it have is. to love and know what you you you, you own, right? So um, and my sales was never really great because of that. But at the same time, I was not. Uh, I was always welcome because at least you have the knowledge. You have yeah, the skills. If there's some new guys, I can share with them. You know. So I, I did that for for uh, throughout most of college uh, when uh, uh, on the weekends, and uh, that's where my interest in photography came. What was you studying in college? Uh, I did marketing, which is still I would say still my primary strength in, right. in, in uh, my career. Uh, but you know that my I had a very focused career because of that. So the uh, uh, when I graduated, you know, um, my brother was working at a local magazine. Uh, well, it's not local; it's uh, it's German. But uh, in locally, he was working in a magazine called Chip, right? Right, okay. Chip magazine. So at that time, it was uh, one of the bigger you know tech magazines in the market, and they were coming out with a. Um, a photography and video, which is called Ship Photo Video Digital, hmm. uh, which still exists, although I'm not sure if it exists in Malaysia now. Um, but uh, they, I got an introduction, and I actually uh, started my first job there in editorial. Uh, it's my first experience, but I've been I was there for only about nine months to a year. But you know that gave me a lot of insight into uh, the publishing industry because, like my my personality uh, when selling products when I was doing magazines although it was not really my job I was just supposed to write about cameras were you good at writing Uh, have you spent a lot of time writing for this Uh, well I've been writing over the years um, you know and I have a lot of experience actually doing editorial and uh, producing publications uh, as well as uh, you know editing work Uh, it's not something that I'm professionally trained to do right it's something that I've gained a lot of experience doing because I just took the opportunities to do it when I had them. So I was uh, doing magazines for, for the, the, my first job uh, and, uh, and that was where I really refined my interest in photography because I didn't just sit there and write. Mm. I actually decided to do a lot of community initiatives. That was also my first uh, foray into actually working with communities, dealing with them, supporting them. You know, It's always something I've been interested in. It was never really about a, a no commercial aspect behind it, but the idea was uh, I could learn from people as well as share with people. So it's a, you know community uh, was always a big part of what I did, even though uh, uh, photography community specifically, and um, that's where I refined my photography. I did a lot of photography then. I did a lot of shooting. I did some. 
I did some, uh, you know, uh, what's that called? Uh, CSR related things with the community. No, no, no companies involved, no backing involved, you know. So that was in magazines. And uh, I also learned a lot about publishing there. I learned mm. the ins and outs, you know. I, I really spent a lot of time understanding how the magazine industry worked, even though it was a short time. And that has uh, helped me a lot since then because I actually understood how things work uh, in the business. And uh, I did that for about a year. Uh, I, and I was quite productive then, I felt. That was always the most important year in my career, I believe, because that set a very clear foundation. But I had to admit, it wasn't a really stressful job. Mm. We could literally finish work in a week. Mm. I had a lot of free time <clears throat> in that magazine for some odd reason. Maybe because it was licensed and most of the content was foreign. All right. Okay. Um, and unlike most magazines, uh, most magazines, would, if it's an international license, the content ratio is about 70-80% yes. international and 20 or 30% local. Even though I had that luxury, I didn't want that when I was doing the magazine. So instead, what I did was, although I was, I was under an editor, I actually wrote 70% of the magazine's content myself. You know, I wanted it to be 70% local, you know. So my editor was just dealing with the translated work, you know, and I was actually directing it, you know. He, he wasn't really passionate about the magazine. He was doing was a job. I see. I was more interested. So I ended up doing a lot of local content and that made me meet, you know, people in the community, met a lot of photographers, you know, or enthusiasts, you know, that... That was kind of uh, how I, I, I worked in publishing. So I was actually quite active despite it not being a high uh, workload kind of job. Then while I was there, the, the company that I used to work part-time selling cameras for, uh, and I was primarily selling cameras for Sony at the time. Right. And that's, that was when Sony only had compact cameras. They had no SLR cameras. And, mm. uh, and uh, she knew, the, the person who was the owner of that agency, she knew people in... Uh, Sony uh, mm. and they were looking for uh, someone to manage the brand marketing for a brand that they had just acquired which was when they bought over Comic Con Minota called yes. Sony Alpha right so they were looking for someone who was young to take up this portfolio that they were quite uncertain of at that time because uh, it was a new venture it's not something that Sony has done doing professional photography and they just acquired a whole company and they were coming out a new range of products to, to do it and, and they had no expertise in, in their company of anyone who actually understood photography. So they were looking in the industry, you know, and because I was doing the magazine, I was selling it at one point, I got a recommendation, I tried it, I uh, went for the interview. Uh, I remember it was my first proper interview because when I got the magazine job, it wasn't really an interview. It's like, okay, we need someone, just go. So it, I, I didn't really have qualifications to do what I did uh, for publishing, but I just happened to have an opportunity and you know I just did it so the Sony was different because it was quite a serious you know I went through multiple layers of uh, uh, interviews but when I look back I think the interviews weren't as hard as I thought but mm. the inexperience of going for a, going through it the first time a big MNC's interview was a little bit stressful for someone who you know who was still just trying to make you know, get a foot in, in the corporate world so um, and I went for that and I started the job and I think that job uh, really defined me. My time in Sony really defined me as a person because mm. uh, that was where I had to deal with everything that uh, people probably would not want to deal with. You know, being a large MNC, they would have a lot of corporate politics. You know, I probably went through every kind of boss that people didn't want to go through. Right. Uh, my first boss was a guy who did not have any faith in me. Um, I'm not sure if I would, I, if he had a lot of prior management experience in terms of managing staff but uh, he never really managed me uh, you know I was actually you know joining Sony was like trying to it's like throwing a kid into a pool who doesn't know how to swim you know you're thrown into the deep end and you're expected to survive mm. I think the first three months for me was very hard because going into a corporate company like that uh, and there was no guidance I mean there was nobody to tell you what to do or to tell you this is what you're supposed to do you know they kind of expected you to just know. And that was that's very difficult because my superior at that time was not really a person who wanted to guide me. You know, I do not know how it was like, but you know, when, even when it comes to sales targets, you know, instead of telling me how to do it, you know, they'll just berate me on the side. You know, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And then they'll do it themselves. So that was, that was a very steep learning curve. 
mm. and uh, and also that was a, a, an education for me that in life, <laughs> you know, you got to help yourself. Right? You yeah. can't expect people to help you at all. So you know, I did something that a lot of people do not know. When I was there, I think my first year, because I was I was under threat of uh, well, I was actually told that I would be let go mm. within three months because I was not performing. And that really woke me up, you know, because. You know, I realized I needed to do something for myself. And for three months, I was kind of lost in that company. So I spent every spare time I had just talking to people. You know, I, I always had a, a, a thick skin. You know? I always would go and speak to people and ask questions. But this really tested me because I really had to, I had to be shameless, really. You know, and I went to everyone whom I thought could help me after work hours and actually ask them, hey, you know what, I really need to learn this. I have no idea how to use the system. I need, could you teach me? And I, and, I, and I was very fortunate that I had a friend um, who was actually in procurement. Um, she's been there for dec a decade or so, you know. And uh, she's a really nice lady. And she's, she was also a bit of a loner, but she was very good with her job. And uh, after work, she'll stay back and put in extra hours to finish her work. She's one of those, you know, who mm. just works very hard. And uh, she was kind enough every day to kind of sit down with me and because she's been in the company so long she knew every process yes, in and out. every process you know what you're supposed to do what you're not supposed to do so I actually learned a lot more about how systems work you know how the procurement systems work I learned a lot of things that have nothing to do with my job uh, but you know that that really defined me because I realized the value of learning things that seems unnecessary to your job yeah but that knowledge really helps so I learned a lot about systems to the depth that I did not need to know and, and uh, I also learned about the whole process with the company. I learned about what, how things work, you know. And nobody explains this to you because there's no clear induction program. In fact, maybe they themselves don't know. They only probably know their own sector, but maybe not on a holistic perspective. Of the well, analysis. certain people know. People have been there long enough, you know, yeah. and, and people in management. But when they do an induction program, I think the biggest flaw for most MNCs is a flawed induction program. Mm. Because the induction program we went in, and, and I've done it before, uh, when, and, but they would just have a session, you know, and then they put people there, uh, the new staff. And then they would just call each department to come in and just kind of say what they do. Which is very difficult for, for a new employee to, to grasp because, you know, I think the first problem that most people have in starting a job is figuring out what they can and cannot do. Right. What's the boundaries? What's the limit? You know, and, uh, and, and it's very hard to get that from just a one day induction program you know you don't actually learn what are you supposed to tell this guy to do is it within your jurisdiction to work with this person especially for new employees so mm. a lot of people had that problem and i was very fortunate that because i went just i just went and asked for help every department you know like i went to accounts okay how do i do this you know i went to the procurement okay what does this mean you know what does what do all the jargons mean you know at that time they had things like stock aging Mm. You know, so a guy like me at the time I was like, what do you mean by stock aging? Especially How? when you're coming from editorial, you have no clue what the hell is I had, I had no clue, you know, so I had to ask, you know, what does stock aging mean? And what do you, and, and, and every company has a, a bit of a different definition, you know, yeah. because of the thresholds of how long they can keep stock, you know, what's the implication, it leads to warehousing, they're all interlinked. You just that, you don't know. And how many people actually went to that level? And I, I actually spent a lot of extra hours and I, I conditioned myself to working in a Japanese corporate culture, you know. I put in a lot of extra hours. I worked until 9 or 10 every day for like, you know, my first, actually my first few years in Sony. You know, I worked weekends, you know. I just had to, I had to make up for lost time. I had to catch up, you know, and learn everything. How long were you in Sony then? I actually served two tenures in, in Sony. Right. I, my first, I think, was about three and about three years plus. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and, and my first year was kind of my learning year. You know, I had to learn the entire business. And I was fortunate because I was actually in, in charge of a business portfolio. It was very small at the time in Sony. It was almost negligible. So I had a lot of room because, any, because it's a new business, right? So any, any result... Yeah, it's a spike. It's a spike. You know, so that was that was where I was lucky. You know, so my first year I had a lot of opportunity to kind of just learn the business. Then in my second year was where I started to really shine. Mm. Partly because my superior at that time resigned. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, he was actually to me at that time a major barrier. I don't think he meant 
to be that way so I don't blame him mm. you know in hindsight it's just that you know maybe at that time he didn't realize it as well right. and he didn't and I was fortunate that he also left after about four or five months and that was when I started to I really needed to perform so after my first year I really I went all the way you know, I knew how to do everything I was equipped with the knowledge I had the one year was very important to me and then you know I've never looked back I mean the second year I've achieved a lot of success I've grown the business the and third, all this throughout is with uh, with the with the alpha series yeah well I, I absorbed the pop, certain portfolios as I went along uh, I helped out in certain categories of business I was actually doing a lot on the accessory business right doing really small items you know and and uh, and I learned uh, to, to manage that kind of business as well. Uh, and uh, you know, second and third year, I, I became more ambitious. You know, I wanted to really prove myself. So I, I started a lot of big projects. Uh, which, lucky for me, every project that I gambled on worked. And I was also fortunate that my boss at that time, after he started realizing that you know, when he started to accept my capabilities, you know, he gave me a free hand. You know, he accepted that he did not know photography as much as I did. So he mm. took my word for it. And you know, unlike what most people believe, there isn't that much data or quality data you can work to do marketing or business. Mm. Everything was really a gut feeling. Yeah. Everything was kind of my involvement with community, the talking to photographers and just coming to my own conclusions about what would work and wouldn't work. And I gambled on a lot of things. You know, uh, we were the first, I think, in any of the brands to believe that you know a brand should grow with its customers i mean a lot of camera brands say they do and uh, i'm not i'm not being critical about them now but you know at that time a lot of brands said that they do but essentially they're box pushers you know they're just pushing boxes they're just trying to make sales everything was a marketing message and when i was able to put a stamp on the business myself i told myself that you know i wanted to do a business where the feeling was like a family, like a community, you know, that the customers were not just a customer. The customer was an integral part of the whole ex brand experience. The customer was the brand. I wanted to change that, you know, and in a company where everyone was just on sales, that kind of talk was actually very complicated. So I had to adjust my message, you know, I had to, I had to change it so that I could achieve that marketing message and that goal while still, you know, uh, delivering on the sales numbers. So I did a lot of gambling, you know, I, I gambled that, you know, okay, you know, if we grew with our customers, how do we grow? Because Sony at that time was a new brand and we didn't have a lot of professionals mm. we're dealing with us, you know, nobody, no professional took us seriously, no professional takes Sony very seriously even today, you know, like uh, it's something that they've always struggled with. It's not because they didn't make good products, it's just because the brand loyalty for the other brands was so strong. So, so strong. At that time it was uh, uh, during the Canon. It still is to a certain degree, you know, but at the same time, they also viewed Sony as a, what's that called? A, 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 they're not a camera brand kind of thing. Yeah. You know, that, that, that elitist mindset uh, still exists today, you know. And uh, it was a lot of challenge. So I, I had to build a new group of people. I had to build people from the ground up. And the only way was to fast track people, the Sony users, from being complete amateurs because they're the only ones giving Sony. Yes, to actually become somebody good. So we actually decided, we were the first, I think, to provide free education mm -hmm. together with the, the product. If you buy, you, you get a free education. Who was doing all the training? Me. And, and user training you were doing? I was pretty much doing everything because that business, they had no money to invest, right? They didn't want to invest in a lot of things. Uh, they, they, they didn't have a budget for a new product, so I had to do a lot of things uh, myself. Of course, we had a training department that assisted us as well, but I had to do a lot of my own trainings, especially dealer trainings. I've pretty much done trainings in every part of Malaysia that I can think of. I had to fly around, I got to train in Penang, Kuantan, Ipo, JB, um, you know, East Malaysia. I've been to big city, big towns, small towns. I had to do it myself for, for, for a good part of the, the first year. And uh, I even did uh, my own community newsletter, you know, because I wanted to, to share what we were doing with the community. So I did a community newsletter, which I wrote every month myself, you know, photograph ourselves, you know, that kind of thing, with the help of people who design, distribute it through stores. It was a really difficult time uh, for the business. But, you know, all that really paid off because, you know, the business grew about 300% in its third year, you know, because we, we were ambitious, you know, we did. We tried to do as much community experiences as possible. And it was easy for you to justify all this work that's being placed in. Uh, as, because all these things are all cost, cost centers. 
we're talking about trading in your time, mm -hmm. uh, developing the, 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 the coursework is also in your time. Yeah. And that time could be used to push numbers than anything else. Well, I had to do those things during off work hours. Mm -hmm. So because your business was still so new, so whatever spike you get or whatever push you get is an increment. Yes. So that probably didn't affect you too much in terms of your performance then. Well, you see, the thing is, I, I think in the that eyes of your, in, in, the, in the eyes of your management, you do not see that as a, as well, a, as a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess uh, they, because like it or not, I kept the numbers up. So whether right. or not it was because of what I did or not, at the end of the day, the numbers were continuously growing. But I realized that, you know, uh, I, I, at the time, in order to generate the sales, actually, a big part of what I did was just meeting the floor stuff. The dealer's floor stuff. You know? yeah. Actually, I think in my first or second year, almost every single day I would be out of the office in the afternoon, uh, visiting the stores and actually getting to know the floor stuff. Mm -hmm. I actually knew most of my dealer's floor stuff at the time, at least a few. Uh, and until today, a lot of them still, you know, are, you know, we are friendly when we pass by in the mall and all that. And uh, because I just sat there, I talked to them, I spent like an hour or two in, a, in every store. So, you know, I have like a routine on Mondays, this, this mall, I visit X amount of people, blah, blah, blah. And I, I did that a lot. I did that more than anybody that I could remember. I just spent a lot of time in the dealer store. So, how long did you spend at Sony after, doing, after going through all this entire process of building up the business? Uh, well, as I said, like, the first time there was three years plus. Three years, and then after that was. Uh, then I quit. Uh, there was a few factors. I think for me, one of the main reasons was because I. I, the third year was great for me, it was right. because uh, I did the convention, which was a huge project which Tokyo was fully supportive for, yeah. it's only Tokyo, you know, uh, HQ, and uh, you know, that, that really grew our business, and, uh, and I got an award for that uh, international special recognition award, which I felt very good about because it's quite rare that a Malaysian marketing yeah. you know, would get something like that, you know, and, uh, because we were the first in the entire Sony you know, business globally to actually do something like that, you know, which was in 2008. And uh, and I also did a lot of other projects uh, which, which gave us a, I got a local award and I got an international award uh, for our projects. And um, and I was really looking to further my career, I wanted to advance. But uh, there is a virtual glass ceiling, all right, because of race. Oh, because okay. it, it is a Japanese company and uh, like it or not, there's a virtual glass ceiling in terms of either number of years or in terms of uh, whether or not you're Japanese or not. Yeah. Which is, you know, like it or not, that is the reality. Like yeah, reality. Cer certain key positions, right? And there was no way for me to go up. I was already a product manager uh, managing. Uh, at that time, I think the entire camera business, both the compact and the, the, the premium, uh, sorry, the SLR system. So I, I was managing about, I think, 140 million portfolio at the time. And yet, I was still uh, ranked as a product manager, and there was just no room to go up. Uh, even though my, my, my boss, uh, you know, I, I, of course I had a boss, mm -hmm. and which I respected. I had a very good uh, string of bosses after my first superior. And, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 there was just no opportunity to go up. Right. I, I realized that, so I decided, you know, that maybe it was time to venture into my first business, which is uh, still the, the same company, called Revan. Uh, Revan is uh, my company that I set up, which was actually a studio at first, a photography okay. studio, all right? So I spent about a year and a half there. And I think uh, that, I have to admit, that that year and a half, I failed miserably. Mm. Uh, you know, I've never done my own business before. Uh, and, uh, it, but it taught me a lot of things about the struggles that a photographer would actually go through. And I did it professionally for about a year and a half. And and that was probably the hardest time in my life. I made a lot of bad decisions. I made a lot of bad investment decisions in terms of how I should spend my money, how I should allocate my, my revenues, you know, I, not my revenues, my, my investments. You know. I just wanted to do nice things like I was so used to it. Sony, I wanted to do <coughs> excuse me, big things. You know. I, I spent a lot of money on my renovation of my studio. Mm. That's, that's insane, I would say, because my studio really doesn't require that much um, beauty. For a studio, I mean, if you've seen studios in this country, they're basically just bare boxes with yeah. double chairs and stuff. Mine had a soundproof room for for audio recording. You know, I had 
with the glass and everything, you can see through. I had that. Uh, I had a. I had a. I had an indoor garden first as a as a waiting area. You know, wow. I, I I really spent money that I didn't have. Where where was the where was the city? Is it, uh, is it still around? around? It's still around in its in its in its in its current state. It's just that I rented it out. Right. Yeah. And uh, I struggled really hard. You know, we did a couple of jobs. Uh, we did a lot of uh, corporate stuff, uh, corporate videos, and all that. So it wasn't unproductive. But you know, the realities of business sank in. Not enough to catch up. One is not enough to catch up. The other thing is that uh, you know, uh, Malaysian companies are really bad paymasters. Mm -hmm. You know, so we can do a job, but it'll take eight months to get payment. Yeah. You know that kind of thing. So. It's, it's a sad reality, but something that I never encountered and I never experienced it being on the client side of Sony. I realized Sony has that problem too. It's not like they're paying people on the spot. I always made it a point to pay my suppliers on the spot, but generally I see a trend that takes about six months to get payment. You're not talking about small checks here. You're talking about huge sums of money. It seems to be hundreds of thousands. And as the, as the studio and we're dealing with corporate clients, although the, the numbers sound good, you know, like a one video job, it wasn't a big job. You know, it was a corporate video, five minute video. It was about, we charged about 30, 35,000. Right. Which would have been a two week work job at best with a, with a, you know, a bare bones team. We took eight months to finish it. Because the client just kept changing it. Oh, you know? the client was. They couldn't make up their mind. They couldn't make up their mind. They, and, and they didn't, they, you know, it's. And, and at that time, we weren't experienced. You know, when I was in, in Sony, I always wondered why agencies would have a limit. Like, okay, you can have three changes, yes. and if you if you exceed the charge or something like that, hour. there's always a kind of you know clause that, that has that. And I, I never had that. You know, I wanted to do good service. I thought as a client at that time, I thought it was ridiculous. Yeah. So when my client asked, I said, you know what? As much you know, we'll we'll have leeway. You know that kind of thing. And he just kept changing. It's like he wouldn't change everything in one go. He watched the video. Okay, I want you to change this part. I want you to change this part. It's always just bits and pieces. And that would drag on and on and on. It took eight months to finish the video. Then he made payment to us. And he didn't give us like an upfront, you know, that kind of thing. Which is a lot of companies, even if you put that in a the contract, they don't care. Yeah. They'll just sign it and they'll pay you at the end. Or much later than that, you know. Sure. So, and, and it really wasn't our fault at that time, but we had no choice. Now. So all these kind of realities sank in, you know. Accounting issues, cost issues, you know. Uh, competition at that time, you know, I was I was too confident. I was overly confident uh, that you know my business model would work because I wanted to do trainings for for, for dealers, you know, because I was doing it. You know, that was one thing that I thought I did very well because in Sony, you know, I, I I did so many dealer trainings. I knew how it worked. I knew how to do it well, and we wanted to offer that service. But I also realized the other reality is the human aspect of business, mm -hmm. where because of who I am. Because of who I associated with, the brands were actively trying to block our business from happening. Right. Okay. I mean, we, we actually saw the dark, the ugly side of business. You know, just because of the human part of it, and yeah. people are dislike you. You know, uh, they'll be like, you know, they'll tell all my dealers because I work with deals. I didn't work with brands. Yeah. You know, I say I work with deals. You wanted me to train anything, whatever brand you want, I will do it. No problem. I know every product. It's fine. And I knew it much more than any trainer out there who was in the camera companies, right? And I was like, I'll, I'll do it for you. I'm not asking for a big fee. I just want to do good business, you know? I just want to do a long-term business. And I, did, I only found out when I folded the business that the brand, there were a few brands who were actively telling the dealers that not to support us. Hmm. So we were wondering, why were we not making any headway? You know, we, were, we were not competing with anybody else. We were, I did, at first we did consumer trainings. We had a lot of competitions there, you know, photography, workshops, Right? Yeah. So dealers were well, something that we thought would be neutral. Nobody was doing it. So we went and tried doing it, but what we got from brands was uh, uh, what we found out later was brands were telling them, no, don't support them. I will do the training for you. I will help you. And uh, that really was a problem because the brands couldn't piss off. I mean, the dealers couldn't piss off their principles. Yeah. So, so we were completely blocked out. And I think the worst incident of this was one of the dealers I think who was in Matamas, I think it was the Canon concept store or something like that. You know, uh, uh, who they were in a tough state, right? So we proposed to them a project where we would do marketing support. We would help them to market the business. We would do training. We would do consumer trainings for them. We would do staff training for them. 
and we will try to generate traffic for them through community building and all that for a very small fee. It wasn't it, we we charge something like what you would pay one employee in the store right. for that kind of value. It's a kind of, it, to us it was really big, and uh, what the brand promised them was you know the one who was managing at that time they're not there now but at that time they're saying. No, don't support these guys. We will do all these things for you. Mm. And that business was tough because they had no experience in the camera business, the the the, 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 the retailer, right? So, and what happened was the principal did nothing, and they folded it. They had to fold because they were just, you know, our our location here is not at prime at this moment. It's not like it's the big mall, but we're not that bad. That those that dealer was worse. You know, it was really. In a really bad location. It may be Hatamas, but it was so hidden you don't even yeah, know it Hatamas exists. Is, uh, Hatamas has always, always been a very, very bad wall part because you know, everyone was saying it's going to be the next bar sale should be complex. That was the original uh, sale. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, due to unforeseen circumstances, it's, it's never been yeah, it anywhere. Never, it never took It's, it's always been in the middle. It never been. Alright, so when you folded Raven, uh, where do you go? Well, actually, I didn't. I didn't exactly fold. Um, we were in a tight spot at that time, and uh, I was, uh, and my my girlfriend, who is now my wife, uh, at that time, we were kind of struggling very hard. And right. uh, although I could keep on going at that time, but um, I w- I realized that I was also causing a lot of stress to my family, as well. They were worried about me and my wife as well, um, and uh, you know. We were we were dating at that time, but she was really an integral part. She did everything with me, you know. So it was very hard for her. And uh, I had a call one day from Sony again, uh-huh. and uh, and uh, they called up and they said, you know, we have a position uh-huh. that uh, we need you to we would like you to come back and uh, to speak to the new boss, uh, who was a new Japanese guy. Like. So um, and the position was interesting because it was a position that I would have wanted to get mm. if I didn't leave. So, uh, you know, I, I said, okay, you know, I would leave this uh, free life of uh, doing photography and, and go back into corporate. Like, that was and Raven was completely bootstrapped by herself, right? I mean, you, you, whatever savings you had. Actually, it's my parents. Right, which, okay. Which, which made things worse, like, you mm. know. That was also a valuable lesson. Like. I, I have to admit, I mean, before that experience, I probably was a pretty much a, a selfish uh, PJ boy, you know, kind right. of thing who... My parents had money. They weren't rich, but they had, uh, you know, they made good money. But you know, I also realized that, you know, you shouldn't squander your family's money. Mm. You know, uh, that that was a bit of a wake up call for me. I think that you know, it set my priorities straight. You know, I, I probably developed a bit of an ego in my first time in Sony. You know, uh, with the success I gained in the second and third year, I was, you know, I would I would I don't know how people see it to me as a person. I thought it was quite a quick rise from zero to hero in the corporate world kind of thing. And uh, I think that was the big problem. So I never looked at that one and a half years of doing my studio as a failure in, because it was the biggest teacher, you know. It taught me a lot of things, you know. I did a lot of things that nobody has tried before and I also ex- it also put my mind straight and kept my priorities in check. So I, I decided to, you know, to take up the offer. Um, mm. I went for the interview. And uh, I was effectively middle management mm. uh, uh, with that appointment with my own team and own staff, you know. And uh, you know, I, d- I don't think I did very badly in my second tenure there, but I didn't stay very long. Uh, I was doing okay, but somehow the corporate culture has changed to a point that, um, and I think it has deteriorated. And I think it's re- reflective in in the current situation there, where you know they've also become the box box pushers that yeah. I never expected them to be and I, I and I didn't really think that was the right way to do business but you know and I had an MD who who was uh, very you know he was supportive of what I did because I wanted to do good business you know I went in with a with a new sense of resolve understanding the dealers understanding suppliers and trying to do good business you know and that unfortunately is not the philosophy that you find in corporate Malaysia like. I mean everyone is very selfish. Mm. I tried to work well with my dealers. I tried to do, you know, it was, it's a time where photography was starting to decline a little bit uh, with the coming of mobile phones, you know, iPhones and stuff like that, where camera capability has improved so much. And you know, the camera business has always been looking at this threat for years. Yeah. The digital threat, the mobile threat, but they've never really tried to do anything about it. And I wanted to do something about it. And the first thing I realized was about margins. 
Because if you know about the camera business, the margins for selling a camera almost doesn't exist. Yeah. The price is so, uh, I, I don't know how to put it, but basically people normally just sell at cost price. Even here we have cameras, you know, it's a service. We don't actually care about making money from it. It's not that we don't want to make money from it, but it's difficult when the first price that comes up from their mouth, when a it's customer, already low. It's, it's the cost. Yeah. It's not low, it's our cost. Right. You know? And I genuinely tell people, that's my cost price if you want take it. But just understand that you're not contributing to this space. I mean, that's the reality. I, I don't even get angry anymore because that was just how bad it was. You know, and I, w- I had a mission when I joined back Sony was to do a business where every price would be controlled. I know it sounds bad that consumers think that price controls is, is you know, it's wrong to a consumer, you know, but at the end of the day, if there is no margins to be made from a business, so there's no reason to exist. No, I mean, there's it's, no it's, reason for dealers to carry any products. No, I mean, that's the surface, but it's a negative spiral, you see. Yeah, yeah. If a company does not make money, it means that he pays his staff less. Yes. They can't justify staff commissions, they can't justify product, you know, salaries, you know, people get paid less. When people get paid less, service quality goes out the window. Yep. That's always the first thing that Broad goes out. knowledge as well. Product knowledge goes out. There's no it. reason to, to stay and back to learn. Exactly. And what affects after that is the customer buying experience, mm. of course. Not only that, buying power is affected because it's a negative spiral. When the, the, the store doesn't make money, businesses don't make money. When businesses don't make money, they don't pay their people well. Yes. They pay, don't pay their people well, people have less money to spend. Yeah. So it just perpetuates that negative spiral. So it's, it, is, it is selfish to say that it's a 100% consumer right that they should be getting things cheap or free. Yeah. You know, it, it has to be a fair business. They shouldn't over, overcharge, but you know, consumers should expect to let people make money. But consumers consumer should also know that if they want intelligent conversations with the, uh, with the salesperson or the yeah. professional that's selling them the equipment, yeah. they need to be able to, to give back by giving a little bit more, uh, more uh, what do you call this, margins back to the reseller. So yeah. that the reseller has a reason to learn all these intelligent discussions. Otherwise, yeah. no point going on Facebook complaining about how unknowledgeable these people are because you Simply won't pay for it. You are not willing to pay yeah. you know, for their knowledge. You won't pay for service. And I think that's the problem with Malaysian consumers. You know, it's unrealistic expectations. You, know? mm. you, you want the cheapest price. You want the best service. You know, I've dealt but you're with so willing to pay but you're not willing to pay for anything, yeah. you know. And uh, and I think that that just doesn't work. But right. you know, we had to start somewhere. Yes. So for me, you know, it was how do we break from this cycle, you know? And that was by true, uh, you know, the principle doing the controls. And um, you know, because I was a very strong-willed person in the company, um, you know, they kind of allow me to proceed with all my plans. I spent nine months cleaning up problems with the business, you know, tightening the ship, you know getting back dealer confidence, you know. That was also a difficult time because every dealer I went to was angry at the brand for some reason. Right. You know, I went around, I flew to different countries. I probably sat there and apologized for Sony more than anyone realizes. You know, I say, I'm sorry, we will, we will try to do good business with you. You know, I, I believed in that, that mutual respect, you know. Yes. Dealers were not, you know, an account. They were our business partners. We had to treat them like people. We had to understand that people need to make money. And we have to, and they have to understand that we have our requirements too. It's a two-way street, you know. But everyone is just one way, one way, one way. And I think that 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 aspect of me really helped because I actually got my my primary business partner and my investor through this. Because you know, um, my business partner is actually from KK. He's a camera retailer, and um, he's our primary investor for the space. And uh, you know, through this dealing with him, you know, he was one of the people who hated. You know, uh, Sony at that time. He had a Sony center in KK, which he closed. You know, because he was just too pissed off to, to, to continue doing that business. You know, he felt it was not done fairly, it was not done right. And you know, I can safely say that I shouldn't be saying this, but you know, Sony centers get a raw deal in this country. You know, mm. don't look at them as a Sony center and think that they're getting the best deal. They're actually not. And a lot of them know that they're not getting the best deal, but they deal with it because the brand is so strong. Yeah. Right. So. And, and, and he really hated them at that time. And I had to say sorry to him. I really did, you know, I tried, and I tried to keep every promise I made. The other thing I learned was every promise you make in business, you have to honor. Yeah. You have to do it. You know, whether or not it means something to you, whether or not you lose money from it, if you make a promise, the measure of you as a business person 
is keeping promises. It's just that simple, you know. And I did that, you know. Everything is if I promise, okay, I will give you what you asked for. I did it, you know. And if there was any problem, I was always the one to say, you know what? Even to my staff, if there was any issues, that like, you don't have to deal with this problem. Let me deal with it. It's my decision, my call, my responsibility. You're just executing it. If you get any flashbacks, just redirect them to me. Right. And I did that, you know. And I and I and I was I was doing that for a long time, and and I built back the dealer confidence. And I was on the, you know, we were at that point where we were improving to a to to a point where I wanted the business to be, and then I got an offer from Leica. Right. Okay. Uh, in Singapore, uh, from Singapore, and uh, you know, and the, but you know, and, and at that time, I, I really wanted to move up, right? And uh, Leica was giving me that opportunity to manage uh, entire the entire business. You know, I would be in charge of Malaysia, so that was the the the, the, the perception that I was given when I was given the offer. And uh, you know, it wasn't because I wanted to leave Sony. It was more that this opportunity came along. Yes, and you know. Leica was uh, and is still the most, uh, how should I call it, the brand that really believes in cultivating photography. You yeah. know, and that part has never left me. You know, and uh, because the offer was there, you know, I decided to, to, to join Leica. It's a bigger portfolio? It's a much smaller portfolio actually, mm-hmm. but uh, it, it was one that fit with my, my ideals a little bit better. Right. Or so I thought at that time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll come to that. Okay. But but anyway, point is, uh, and Sony when I left, and I think the saddest part about that business was that you know I set a lot of, I set a lot of groundwork for the person taking over my portfolio. I said you know there are certain things that you have to do yes. in order to 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 f- complete the promise that I made. Yes. You know I said that you know these are the things that I've set the groundwork for, and you won't see the benefit of it now. But if you went through with it, two years from now, you, Build would, the reap, foundation. you would reap the benefits. And yeah. the main thing was how to, to protect the dealer's margin. That sure. was the whole idea. And that required a dealer cooperation. I've, I got like 50 dealers to sign up an agreement. You know how hard is it to get 50 dealers nationwide to agree that yeah. we will all respect each other? How hard is it to get 50 dealers to sign a, bla- a black and white paper? <laughs> And I did a I did an event, you know. I, that was my last project before I left Sony. You know, I, I went through with it even though I already resigned. But I was like, you know, okay, this is an important event. I flew in dealers from around the country. I got them in. You know, I did a whole keynote presentation about how we should be business partners, right? right. I, I wanted to set the account straight. You know, I said that how should we should be business partners? How we should do the business together? How every dealer here should start respecting each other? Because like it or not, every dealer in the country says that oh, you know. I respect your price, blah blah blah. They never do it. Yeah, they know. They, they never do it. So, and we got them to really agree on it, you know. And that time, you know, there, there is still no law that, that says that we cannot do price fixing. I know it's price fixing, but it's there for. Is none? I thought there is. Uh, there is now, not at that time. Oh, okay. Well, oh, it hasn't even enacted yet, to be frank. Perhaps not in Malaysia, but you know, at Apple, it was it was a very yeah, big. but in, in, in you know Sony works differently. Like, and right. in Malaysia, you know, you know, or maybe on a Malaysian context. Yeah, but different. you know, we we wanted to do that. I know it sounds wrong to most consumers, but we weren't trying to price fix it to make a crazy margin. We wanted right. the price fix just to make the margin you were supposed to make. You were supposed to make. Yes. That's that's all. You know, not to be above the res- the, the recommended yeah. price we set internationally, just to sell it at that price. So to explain to some consumers what it what he, what he means is that you know in every business there's always a what we call a channel margin a margin that's allocated a certain percentage of margin that's allocated to uh, the resellers to make so that they can operate the business so if in most cases um, the consumer were to push the reseller for a discount that discount will come from that margin that channel margin so if uh, competition is too great and uh, the push from the end user is too great yeah the reseller sometimes will go to the extent of making zero channel margin and that is detrimental to the business. Yep. So that's what it meant. Yeah. So yeah, so you know, it was just to protect what margin they were supposed to yeah. make, you know, not not to you not to over inflate the yeah. margin. If they're, if they're supposed to get like twenty percent, let's say you know, out of contacts, right? Mm. Uh twenty percent it's not that. to make thirty percent or forty yeah, percent, but it not. is to make the twenty percent that they have been promised yeah. on contract. Yes. And, and the prices were set internationally anyway. So right. it's not like we could control the selling price yeah. just to honor the selling price. So, you know, and that was really hard. So after I did all that, you know, I got all the dealers to agree and that was hard because I had to visit every dealer individually. Yeah. You know, do a presentation. I did that for Other almost why. nine months, you know. And why? Listen to the grief. Yes, and, 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 you know, and resolve any bad 
issues we had right. in the past, solve problems, you know, that was a, really a lot of work which nobody realized I was doing. And uh, I, it, no, sometimes in corporate, it's too difficult to explain to everybody, you know, so you just had to go with it. And, um, and, and then when I left, I was telling my, you know, the person to take over is the number one thing you do not want to do is to dump the price, to do massive clearances, you know, or to just adjust the price too heavily in the market, you know, you, you wanted to follow through with the plan. Yeah. The minute I left, they dropped the price. And then we lost dealer confidence straight away, you know. And they've never really recovered from that, if you ask me. I mean, they're doing well now because of the products. But when you talk about the market, the business, you know, you hear dealers, everyone's having a really hard time. To, mm. And if that was done in the first place, right now they'd be reaping the benefits. Consumers would take about two years to adjust, to know that, oh, you know, if you buy a Sony, you have to pay retail, no discount. You know, something that Apple has done very well in Malaysia. I mean, people, people buy an Apple product. Not necessary. But, you know, they still ask for it, but they don't mind paying for it at the end of the day. It's, it's a bit of a challenge, but because everyone kind of follows it, yeah. right? So at the end of the day, consumers pay. And I know the margins for Apple is so small. Yeah. It's smaller than cameras. So to be fair, I think they're just doing themselves justice, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that works for them. So, you know, a margin is a healthy margin if you get the margin. Whereas for Sony, we can promise the retailer any margin and they won't get it. So what's the point? Mm -hmm. And it's the same for every other brand. So... In that sense, you know, if they follow through with that plan, I believe by today, they would have not, they would be in a better position than they are now. Right. But because of that, that, that lack of foresight, you know, I believe that they are being very affected by it. But anyway, uh, that's, that's, that's in the past. But uh, then I, I joined Leica. Uh, that was a whole different ball game from big MNC to actually a really small company. Uh, the, the office had a grand total of one employee. That was me. Right, okay. In Malaysia, we're talking Malaysia. about in Malaysia. Yeah, in Malaysia. Yeah. You know, it's a big brand, but they only had three stores. You, know, they, right. you didn't, you don't, at, the, at that time when I joined, there was only one store and, uh, and a bunch of other small dealers who were selling it, you know. And uh, what I did not expect was that, you know, Leica to be a company so focused on just selling. Right, okay. I mean, it's, it, you know, to, for a handmade product, you kind of assume that you make as per demand. Yes. Right. You you would you would supply exactly what the demand wanted. So you charge a premium, but there is no access. There's no reason for us to push boxes. But somehow or another, that was what they wanted, you know. And they had and they had no clear benchmarks of or, or, or accurate benchmarks for sales targets. So sales targets were being made for me, which made no sense. Mm. So this is again another problem because um, my bosses were just basing on some historical data but they didn't know the background because like it or not Malaysia is an exporting country yes. a lot of our numbers are simulated through exports same with market share you know every camera brand if they've done heavy exports they would declare these exports as they are sales so you know Malaysia so what, what we're talking about is grey market Malaysia is a big part of it <laughs> we contribute to the grey market because for especially for camera business there is no tax Right. So import and exporting it, we, we get it cheap and we can export it cheap as well. So it exists as a great market. Yeah. And, I, and I have done it before. You know, I can claim now, you know, I have been a, party, a part of it. You know, and there's no shame about it. It's business. You know. In other countries like Singapore, you know, it's not great. It's just distribution. Yeah. They it's are not great at all. It's not great. Is, you know, it is a distribution. As usual. It's business as usual. That's their business model. They only have about, what, four to six million people, I believe. They yes. can't consume that much. Their sales is as big as Malaysia or Indonesia. Yeah. Why? It's not because they have that many people buying it in Singapore. It's, it's all distribution. At one time, one of the, the biggest reseller in uh, Singapore mm. is larger than one distributor in Singapore. That's yeah. how crazy it was you know, for, for Apple products at one time. Yeah. It's, it's not a lot. So... Um, but that, that, that was, that was kind of the situation, so I, I you know, and, um, and, and Leica was surprisingly not, you know, they, they still want to kind of maintain their heritage, but I think in Asia, their strategy is a little bit different. Right. It's not like how I feel it's in Germany. The brand, in essence, from its HQ is really much, you know, still that kind of brand that you expect Leica to be, you know, who, who loves photography, you know, yes. building the best cameras for photography. But, you know, in, in Asia, I think because of China, and the way the Chinese are buying the most expensive things just because they can, you know, and not because they know what they're buying, you know, that has really affected the perception of the Asian market, you know, and, and you know, Asia is a rich region now, 
just not every part of Asia, you know. Mm. So, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to go in deeper than that. I still have a lot of love for the brand. Uh, it's just that maybe the, the practices were a little bit different than what I expected. So, I somehow uh, found an opportunity to start this place. You know, that, that's why it led me to here because I really just wanted to go back to the fundamental, excuse me, the fundamental root of what I believe in, which was to have a space where we can focus on community building. So was it easy for you to, to, to put on the entrepreneurial hat again uh, ever since the first failure that you have encountered with Actually, I think it was the hardest decision I made. Yeah. Um, but somehow, you know, it's one of those decisions it was more emotionally charged again. You know, it's just that I felt that there was a need. I felt that things should be done a certain way. I did not want to continue contributing to this negative spiral that I call in business, right? And uh, I, I just wanted to focus back on the consumer again, you know, for a brand. And if brands didn't want to do it, I want to do it myself. That was the core of it. And I was fortunate to have the discussion with my business partner, now business partner. And, you know, I, and I pitched the idea to him and said, look, I really don't have that kind of money. I have some money, but not the kind that I need. And I'm looking for someone to share the dream with me. And I think the difference between most other new startups was a lot of startups are based on statistics, are based yes. on proven records. And I really had no benchmark to say whether this would work or not. And I still don't know, to be honest. But it's, it's a kind of business where you take a leap of faith. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and you just hope and believe that what we do here would work. You know? And uh, you know, we, we, I, I shared the idea of, you know, of, of really doing a, a, a concept. You know, some people call it lifestyle retail. You know, others would call it, uh, you know, uh, I call it a community center because and I think the hardest part is nobody understands what that means here. I tried explaining to a customer many times. It's a community center. What does that mean? And then after four, I said, are you a cafe? I said, we have a cafe. We are not a cafe. We do have a cafe. Are you a gallery? We're not just a gallery. We do have a gallery. You know? So let's pull everything to holistic uh, uh, perspective, yeah. right? Maybe you can explain a little, uh, a little bit about what uh, Center of Operation Plant is all about. Okay. Well, at the core of it, we are here to propagate photography. That's right. the core, right? And the name is a very big part of it because Asian photographers denotes the region, yes. not, not the ethnicity or not the culture, but just the region because I feel that in photography worldwide, Asia is hugely underrepresented. Whether the visuals from Asia, whether the photographers from Asia, or whether the, there's no Asian style. Yeah, of photography. You know, there's a, you can talk a lot about how the historical grades of photography from you know West. You know, you talk about uh, people like Ansel Adams. You know, you talk people like Richard Avedon. You know, they all kind of pioneered certain styles, but you don't hear anything from Asia. I mean, they do exist. It's just that they don't get the kind of recognition they deserve. So at the core of it, we wanted to focus on propagating photography specifically from the Asian region, and that Asians also kind of our our ambition we, we would like the concept to go regionally rather than just Malaysia we could have called it Malaysian photographers but you know we thought that Asia seemed to to better represent our goal yes right so and uh, in order to get that I needed a space where we could do everything that photography would allow and what does that entail um, you know a place where you can buy what you need and not just camera gear by buying anything that would help the experience of photography. That's why we sell a lot of travel gear because travel gear, travel photography is a very big aspect of uh, photography. Yes. You know? Most people do it in yes. that sense. You know? Even professionals would do some form of travel photography. They're all going to need that little something that helps them in their trip. So we try to do that. So we have a, probably a more interesting lineup of products than most people have. We don't have a lot of it. We're working on that because we're still quite new. But yeah. you know, that's, that's the emphasis. Then in terms of just having um, a, a place for you to learn something, we have our education. We work with uh, uh, Lightroom Studio and Academy for that. Uh, but we also do some of our own workshops and we're expanding on these programs and we're trying to do more than just photography workshops. You know, We're trying to do things that relates to the art side of things. So this is the, uh, the, 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 the auditorium area that you have upstairs, right? The gallery area. The, the gallery area. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of an, a flexible space. So whether it's downstairs or upstairs, we don't have a fixed space for it, but right. it, it just depends on the, the, the nature of the, the, the workshop. So you can learn something. And then you know, uh, and then uh, you can meet other photographers in our cafe. So we run community activities just to do meetups. 
just to learn because the easiest way to learn is to learn from your peers. Right. You know, it's easier that way. It's less intimidating and it's free. You know, you pay a cup of coffee, a pro sits down or someone a bit more experienced than you, you learn. I learned that way. I didn't have any formal training. But I can teach now because I just asked enough questions. I yes. went to enough community uh, gatherings to learn so much that I knew a lot more than people know. Because you're always going to pick up some little nugget of knowledge, you know. Yeah. A, a certain lighting technique or a way to shoot something or, you know, uh, everything. I just learned just by speaking to people and trying it for myself. So the community experience was there. So I did the cafe. I, and I got a partner in for the cafe as well. So it's in source called Cat in the Box. Because mm-hmm. they, 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 re- they represented uh, what we wanted in the cafe as well. And they make great coffee. So, uh, and, and, they, and they removed their business from Kalana Jaya here. It's their right. only outlet. You know? and, uh, and so far, it's a very good symbiotic relationship. So you know, we have that. Then uh, the, the cafe is a really a big part of it. And I needed a space that can propagate art. Because art, uh, photography in general is hugely uh, yeah. underappreciated in this yeah. country. Uh, a, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, Philippines has a bigger art scene. You know, I went to Indonesia and the most interesting, when I was in Chipa, this was years ago, right? And the one thing that struck me was when I was on the street with my counterpart who's Indonesian, and I was saying, wow, that's a great billboard, you know? And then he said, yeah, in Indonesia, a, a lay person can look at a billboard and say, and that is that particular photographer's style. Ah. They can identify a style from a billboard. They are not talking about someone who's hardcore photography. It's right. a lay person. So that's Indonesia. That's how different it is. You ask a lay person here, you can't identify anything. A pro can't identify anything. They can identify Western styles. We don't identify local styles because local photographers have no way to propagate their style. People don't see their work. Is it because we, we, we do not uh, look into innovation of our styles or...? No, it's just that it's not represented. It's not showcased. You can, only see the, you can only see it on websites. And the problem with just seeing things on websites is that you don't really see the full picture. Yes. It's, 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 it's a very different experience seeing things in huge print. Yeah. So the thing here is, and when I went and in Leica, I actually approached a lot of art galleries to showcase photographic work. You know, that was my, you know, part of the, the, the marketing of, of Leica, you know, we wanted to show photographic work. And that was my first time dealing with galleries uh, uh, professionally. And the one thing that was told to me was that, uh, in a nutshell, uh, that's not the exact words, but in a nutshell, photographic art doesn't sell, so we don't do it. We do it once or twice a year just because it's just a part cakes. of art. Yeah. No, it's a part of art, so they kind of have to do it to kind of be complete. But because it doesn't sell, they don't have any interest to show it. Right. So that's the biggest problem because if you don't have an avenue for photographic art to showcase, nobody's going to identify the style. Yes. Nobody's going to learn the style. Nobody's going to appreciate the photographer for their work. Nobody can... And there's no one to tell you. I thought a big important aspect of having a gallery was that as a, a curator, and I curate some of the, the work here, was that when a person comes to visit the gallery, I can explain to them. I said, this is this person's style. His style, his attention to a certain detail or the way he shoots things or the way he composes things, that's his style. And that's where people start to learn about styles. You need someone to explain it to you. you know, or, or someone to just showcase it and, and, you know, and they can see it enough from this particular photographer. And the other problem is because art galleries are only looking at sellable art, yes. only the good photographers get exhibited. Up and coming guys never do. You know, new guys with talent never do. You know, that's, that's the biggest problem. Yeah. So there's no room for new talent to grow. So the gallery we had here had the opposite uh, direction. It was only for showcase. We funded through the rest of the things, through the merchandise sales, to the coffee, you know, through uh, events, activities, workshops. But the gallery is really just, you know, for showcase. Our emphasis is not selling the art. If the artist wants to sell, that's their right. You know, right. We help. But generally, we don't care if you want to sell it or not. And I think we're the only gallery can say that. Mm. You know, and that's the dream. You know? You've got to start somewhere. And we are taking that biggest leap of faith in hoping that the community here believes in that same dream, believes in that same direction to grow. Because a lot of photographers, there's, there's a lot of camps, right? Photographers who lowball the market because they're not photographers, they're weekend photographers. Yes. Right? They're Someone who's able to just pay the, the price of admission but have got no, no skills whatsoever. 
well, they may have the skills. Actually, the thing is, a lot of these weekend photographers have the skill now. Right. It's just that they don't value their work because they don't care. They right. have a day job. They're probably very rich and they just like taking pictures. They will take a token. They will take anything. They yeah. don't care. So they spoil the market. There are also photographers who basically I don't know, are, are struggling against these people. And that's a huge divide, mm. you know, that kind of thing. And I think that the problem is, is that we've built a market who only values photographic work on price. There is no clear benchmark. The, there is a very small group of people who value good work and they yes. pay top dollar for the best photographers. But everybody else, it's a price it's war. It's a price game. It's they a want, price war. It's yeah. not a price game. It's a price war. I don't care how, what photographs. So someone you give me the 300 at this price, I'm good. Look at Groupon. Yeah. There's a oh. million and one photographers offering, you know, services for yes. photography on Groupon. And that is insane the amount of char- price that they're charging you know and there's always going to be some other way he tries to make money from you yes the groupon is just a gimmick they you know the, the hook you know and then once they've gotten you you know you you're caught right then they'll try to sell you more pictures and all. i mean it's it's just a really messy market mm. so i think that the it's offer okay we ran out of uh, video that's all right but yeah but i think the main thing is that they need to understand most people need to understand that you have to look at building the market, you know, you have to get people to appreciate it first. And there's nobody trying to do that. Every photographer is complaining about the weekend warriors. Every weekend warrior is complaining that people are giving them a lot of, you know, bad negative feedback. Yes. But nobody is trying to cultivate. The good photographers or the most successful ones are the ones who are actively trying to get uh, the market to understand art value. You know, they tell them, they explain to them the amount of work that goes into creation, you know, that kind of thing to maintain price value. And they'll also showcase good work. But everybody else is not doing it. So I think that's the missing element. So we never set out to do our own photography. We set out to provide the complete service mm. to showcase and to appreciate artwork, which, which is why we also do fine art printing here. Even at home, you should have your work in print. It's just a different experience than seeing it on the TV, you know, putting it up on the wall, appreciating it, the quality, the depth, the value is very different. So we have that service here. That's because we want to advocate having art even at home, even your own art. It doesn't matter. So that's been a very big basis of it. And I think our biggest challenge now is ensuring that we make sufficient revenue to sustain this place because um, we are a social entrepreneurship kind of business, which means, you know, we are, it's, it, there is a profit but we're not looking at huge. You know, we just the passion that will we'll eventually draw in the yeah, profit. And we want to sustain. That's the main thing. This place has to be long term. We cannot look so short term and say, oh, you know, it's a hit and run. We are not. We're in for the long haul. And uh, right now, we're trying to work out how to get that number. Lah. So right. it, it's in early days. Um, we're still working on things like our activities and our merchandise sales. And the, and the ball is still new, so the traffic hasn't built yet. But, you know, hopefully with time to come, you know, all things will come up tying together okay so uh, I think you pretty much covered a lot of it I think a lot of the of the, of the challenges of uh, setting up this business falls back to the challenges of the market challenges that uh, you have encountered with the times of Sony as well as Leica and right now what you're trying to do is bringing all this experience in this to form this one space right. and uh, to, to push the whole true uh, nature of photography the, the whole true business of photography yeah so, um, where do you foresee uh, uh, the, the center going to? Is this going to be the one outlet or this, is this going to span to multiple or do you, do you have a vision of spanning throughout the, the country or the, uh, the region? Well, to be honest, I don't envision to have more than one in Malaysia. Um, mainly because I think that, you know, having too much of this then it becomes like a gimmick, right? We just want to represent, we're not trying to, to, to as I said, we're not in for big business. But I, my main hope or wish is that I can find a partner mm. who wants to bring the same concept to Singapore. Right. Because if we want to really create a foothold in the region for this concept, it has Singapore to be there. As, yeah. and I, we have to start there. Yeah. And probably Thailand, you know, that kind of thing. Just one in every key area. And, uh, you know, we are not greedy, as I said. Um, we are not looking for a lot of share or a lot of things, you know, we are happy to give someone who has an equal amount of passion right. to be like the owner of it. We we'll still own the brand kind of thing, but, you know, and we we'll take a small percentage to build it. 
you know, we just want to build it, sustain it, and you know, everybody wins. And that's how I'm, I've been trying to do this business. I mean, some, some customer came in here and said that this is a new concept. It's called cooperative business. Because I have like six or seven and I'm constantly looking for new partners to do this business together. We can't do it alone, right? The reason why most people can't sustain a concept like this is because everybody tries to do it themselves. Yes. I believe in doing it with everyone. Non-competitive business. I do it with you, we grow together, and it starts from me. I have to be not greedy. You know, I have to just make what we need and ensure that everybody makes good business and sustains the place and that's all I'm going for. And I think that, you know, my, my hope is that to get a foothold in Singapore would be next. Lah. That's my immediate dream. I, I dare not dream too far yet. I think that Singapore will be a good start. And but I, I really want Malaysia to work first before we go there. Lah. Okay, you know. So, uh, what would be the top three things you know uh, you would, uh, with your knowledge of uh, starting up two businesses, one being uh, Raven, which was uh, which is still under Raven, time. right? Oh, one. right. This is the same company name. The next progression of Raven, yeah. which is what it is now. Yeah. Uh, what would be the top three things you would tell an aspiring entrepreneur about starting up a business? Well, I think the number one thing is knowledge, and I think that we need to accept that we don't know enough. Yes, and every day we should tell ourselves that. And I think uh, every single day, I I always remind myself to not have an ego. That's why I failed the first time, you know. And and people always say, you know, the wisest people are the people who know they don't know enough. It's only the foolish who thinks they know everything. And I was foolish once, and I know from experience that that's the biggest problem, because being, you know, always telling yourself that you never know enough humbles you, and and you're more open to learn. Mm. Because that opens your mind, you know, and then at the same time, you, you would, and you need every kind of knowledge. And sometimes the knowledge you need is not something that's very apparent, so you just never deny any knowledge. And, you know, they said the best, ma best manager is not someone who does one thing very well, but he knows everything quite well. Yes. And I think that is very true to be an entrepreneur. Mm. So that's number one, you know, to learn as much as possible. At, and the second thing I would advise is to get first-hand experience to learn that knowledge rather than just, you know, like a lot of people I know say they want to do business. But I think the key ingredient is if you want to do like, like a bookstore, you have to work in a bookstore or work in a, or in a company that deals in books. You or, know, at least, or at least have a, a, a big library of books that they have already read and understood. Otherwise, well, I think it's that just opening up a bookstore for the sake of opening up one. Yeah, but I think that you know, like uh, product knowledge is important. But I think understanding how the business works is very oh, important. Yes. And they have to actually do it themselves because the one other thing I did learn was that you know what you think you know and what you need to know are two very different things. Yeah. And and by doing those businesses, you will discover what you need to know. So like I have friends who say, "Oh, I want to open a cafe," and my answer is, "If you want to open a cafe, go work in one." You know, go and experience one, go and actually manage one, then you will know how to do a cafe. I've come across a lot of people who say they want to open up a restaurant but they have no clue how to cook. Exactly. <laughs> and it's I think that's okay, provided you can find a good cook, but you understand that that whole process, you know. I still don't agree with it. Consider the fact that you know if you if you find good cook, you're at the mercy of that cook. That's true. But I think also a bit it depends. If you, you expect the business to be you expect to be self employed, right, then then you should be a good cook. Yes. But if you expect to be a business owner and not be self employed, then you should have a, you should know enough about cooking to pick good cooks each and every time. Right. The, so you must have the DNA, you must have the, yes. the you must prototype. Love you it. must be able to prototype yeah. the, the, the true product that can signify as the signature of the business. Oh, yes. And you're able to, to as a process bring that signature to every cook that you hire. Yeah. That's what is needed. Yeah. yeah. That's why when we wanted the cafe, we never believed that we could do it ourselves. You know? right. We would probably make more money doing the cafe ourselves. But we, you know, realistically, we told ourselves that it's better that you get someone who knew what they were doing yes. and the customer gets the right experience from the get-go than the other way around. So you know, what we don't have, what we like, we work with people to do it. And that's the concept here. Like. And I think the third thing, and I think we, we've covered it quite a lot, is to have the passion for it, I mean, for a business. Your first business, I feel, should always be something you believe in. Right. Because you care about it enough that you will do the best job possible. If you do your first business as something that you don't care about, you would never do it well. Yes. Because you didn't care enough. You know? and, and, and that's, when you don't care enough about something, it's going to fail. Doing your own business, and it's a risk. Uh, I think a lot of photographers have realized it, you know. 
a lot of photographers start out doing full-time photography because they love photography. And when they do the business of it, they realize they hate it. They hate the business of photography. And that's true for me. That I, I went through that as well. The whole business of photography, I hated at one point because of it. You know? So it's always a risk using your passion to do what you do. So you have to also manage your expectations. Right. It's, it's linked. Lah. You have to have passion, but you're going to manage your expectations. You cannot expect to just do things your way, but you have to, you, you want to do things the right way, but you have to be open-minded about it. You have to also accept that there's a lot of ugly with business. You know? So it's passion with right expectation. I think that, that's more appropriate. Lah. Okay. Yeah. Last and final question, uh, where do you find Obviously, this question is a little uh, premature, considering the fact that uh, the center is only what less than two months old. Yeah, but uh, I think in terms of Raven as a as an as a business entity, or where do you find the entire business, um, zero or hero? Well, I would say we are we are zero with a strong belief in hero. Mm. I would say, uh, but as a business, you know, as a whole, because I do a lot of side things which I've not covered. I would not do too long. <laughs> but, um, but you know um, we, we have matured a lot I believe in terms of a business we're not a big company we have about three people right uh, but each and every one has a passion for what we do right. but each of us also has the right expectation and uh, experience as well and I think that that has been um, uh, what's it called uh, that's, that's why I believe that we'll be a hero it's really just finding the right uh, chemistry so to speak and uh, the right kind of model that would work. Right? And we believe this would be it. Uh, at worst case, this would probably be a break-even business, which is possibly our expectation. Some people say we're being a bit too unambitious, but it's better for us to, to work very hard first and let's not worry about trying to make too much money. You know? and, uh, and, if it's, and, and our expectation, if it's a, this is our second business, right? Or actually, it's third. Lah. But uh, you know, if it's something that con is consistent, it's long term, we're happy enough. But I think that what it represents, the concept, is a hero. Mm. So that's why we do what we do. Great. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate no it. Right. Thank you. Thank you.